Hi, I'm Stephanie. And I'm Daniel. We are the host of the EVLC podcast. Where we interview people that are making a positive impact in the world. So, hello, today we are interviewing Brian Bender. He's the founder of the Electric Vehicle Learning Center. He is also the president of the KMG Mortgage Group. In addition, Brian is a pilot and he enjoys paddling and volunteering. Thank you for being here at the first episode of the EVLC podcast. Are you excited to be here? I'm excited to be here. Absolutely. I feel honored. I, am I the first guest? Yeah, you're the first guest. Oh, this is amazing. I'm very yeah. excited to be here. Absolutely. So first off, we wanted to ask you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. How far do you want to go back? As long <laughs> as far as you want. <laughs> Well, uh, I'll give you a little bit of background history. So I was raised in a, uh, in a small town, was born in Palm Springs, California, raised in a small town uh, near Palm Springs. And uh, in my, let's see, when I was, and it, so Palm Springs and Yuma, Arizona. And I uh, did my high school, junior high and high school in Yuma, Arizona. And uh, from there, I finished my high school and started my career in the mortgage business, sorry, hotel business. Then I worked my way into the mortgage business and uh, I've been doing that ever since. And along the way I picked up flying and, and uh, started this wonderful nonprofit with uh, Stephanie. How did you get started with paddling? I'm interested to hear about that the most, like what, how did that happen? Like your okay. paddling competitions? That's a good question. So when I was 22 years old, I was offered a job with uh, the hotel I worked for, the company. I was in, working in Phoenix, and they gave me an offer to move to uh, Huntington Beach, California, or Maui, Hawaii. Uh -huh. And since I didn't know anyone in Maui, Hawaii, or I, I, I had never been there, I thought that would be the most adventurous decision. And you know, everyone dreams of Hawaii, right? The beaches and the sun and the surf. So uh, I decided to take the position in Hawaii, and um, it wasn't till about three or four years later in Hawaii that I started to pick up paddling. Um, I I joined a, a, a yacht club, and I saw a bunch of paddlers walking around all different ages with their paddles, and I'd seen them in the canoes before paddling out in the ocean, and so I decided to give it a try. So I, I signed up for the club, and that's when my paddling career started, probably in 2000 four or five. Oh, so you've been doing it for a while then? Quite a while, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, that's cool. I read that and I was like, whoa, what the I didn't I didn't expect that. I was like, wow. Yeah. It's very cool. it's very unique. It's uh like Polynesian style paddling with six people in the canoe and you don't I didn't notice it before on the mainland, but when I moved from Hawaii to San Diego, I realized the sport is just as big in, in Southern California, actually really all up and down the west coast of the United States um as it is in hawaii um and uh so I, I got to continue when i left hawaii and moved to san diego so it's pretty cool wait so how long have you lived in um hawaii for i lived in hawaii from 2004 no sorry 2002 to 2015. oh okay so Quite a 13, while 14 then. years yeah i spent a lot of time out there amazing place yeah okay that's cool. So can you tell us why you started EVLC? EVLC, that is a great, great question. So a long, long time ago in a, a town near Palm Springs where I was born, I lived in this uh, little town called Yucca Valley, California. And my mother had me when she was 18 years old. And can you imagine having a kid at 18 years old? It's quite young. Yeah. And uh, not long after that, she had my brother about four years later, and uh, she had divorced her and, her and my father had split. So it was just my mom raising the two of us. And fortunately, this thing existed in our town called the Boys and Girls Club. And I don't know if you two are familiar, if you ever heard of the Boys and Girls Club? Yeah. Oh, no, I haven't. So it's, it's, a, it's one of the largest nonprofits in the United States. It's a an, an after school program for kids. And if you can't afford it, there's always a way there's sponsors that can pay for you to attend. Uh, so in a lot of cases, it's free for, for low income families. And our family was a single parent household. It was just my brother and I. So after school 
instead of, you know, going home and just being at the house by herself because my mom worked, uh, the bus, there was a Boys and Girls Club van that would pick us up from our elementary school and take us to the Boys and Girls Club. And at the Boys and Girls Club, it's, you know, a safe place where you have, you know, hundreds of other kids where you, you know, you can play foosball, you can do arts and crafts, you can play basketball, you can do all this cool stuff. You can basically be safe until, you know, you're, in my case, my mom got off work and she'd come and pick us up. So it was a safe place for us to go after school for, in our case, I think it was about three or four hours a day. And so from the time I was, God, as long as I can remember, six years old, uh, until probably my sophomore year of high school, I was a boys and girls club, club kid. We called us club kids. So I just grew up in a boys and girls club. So I was inspired as I got older uh, to be involved in the boys and girls club. And so I, in Hawaii, I became a board member of uh, a club on Oahu and I helped um, coach girls basketball of all things, which is pretty awesome. I got to coach basketball and uh, just be involved in the club and the decision making and um, all the fiscal responsibilities that the board does. And um, so I, as an adult, I got to come back full circle and, and give back in that sense. So when I moved to San Diego, I joined the board there. And it was during that time where I really started to think as much as I liked the Boys and Girls Club, I wanted to do, I just had this urge to do something a little bit, a similar concept, but something a little bit different, something that where kids can go that was a safe place, just like the Boys and Girls Club, but they would actually learn something that could help them in their lives and their career. So Boys and Girls Club was very, at the time, this was you know, a long time ago when I was much younger, was you just go there and kind of play. And I wanted to have an environment where kids can actually play, but learn. So I was watching a bunch of YouTube videos uh, in my house and I came across E.B. West and Michael Bream's videos and they were doing this cool stuff, converting Volkswagens into electric. And I, from there, I just started thinking like, oh, it'd be so cool. I got it. From there, I kind of started thinking about Volkswagens and wanting to buy one and wanting to convert one. And so I just kind of went down this rabbit hole and, and learned as much as I could, watched all of his videos. And then one day I was like, you know, what? I'm just going to drive over to EV West. It's here in San Diego. I live 45 minutes away. I'm just going to, you know, get in. I, at the, I had purchased a bus and kind of started my process. And I said, I'm going to drive over and meet Michael Bream and start my conversion process. So at the time I didn't, I still kind of had the idea in me about doing something, an after school type program. I didn't know what it was going to be. Uh, and so I had met Michael. We started talking about converting my bus. He was really helpful, gave me ideas, gave me the whole quote. And then uh, I remember driving away that day thinking like, wow, it's so neat what they're doing after I did the tour of EV West and I saw what they're doing. Like, this is amazing. Like, this is the future, you know? And so I drove away and then I, I, I emailed Michael about a week later and said, hey, I have this idea about doing an after school program and I don't know what it looks like, but I think it would be neat to do it with things that you're doing in your field. And so I said, yeah, that's cool. I'm very interested. Like, come, come by and let's chat about it. So I went back and, and talked to Michael again. And it was just really organic. Him and I were talking about the ideas and none of us really had a clear picture yet, but, but we knew the who. It's so funny how life works. Like, I started as an idea. We just started dialoguing. And Michael was like, I think, he's like, do you know Marshall? And Marshall's one of our board members, which I think both of you have met before. And I said, I do know, I paddle with Marshall. So it's funny you asked me about paddling because I met Marshall paddling in San Diego. Michael met Marshall because um, they converted, you know, some two or three of his vehicles already. So here's this guy we knew and his, his he's going to be a great guy you guys want to interview because he has a really cool history about yeah. um, working with NASA and all this stuff. So um anyway so the who came up you know marshall yes i know marshall i think let's get him on the board and then hey my other friend adam molnar uh you know he he's a great guy and he's in commercial real estate he knows a lot of people i think he'd be good so we talked about adam and margarita I was working margarita was at the time um she was coaching me she was helping me get my projects and ideas 
organized because I had all these projects and ideas I wanted to work on. So her and I would spend a couple hours a week, Margarita, Stephanie's mom, who's an amazing person. And uh, she's a founding board member as well. And so I was like, Margarita is the last piece we need because Michael was in, I was in, Marshall agreed, Adam agreed, and then Margarita was like, okay, I'm in. She's the only one that knew anything about nonprofits. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a really long answer to your question, but that's kind of how the story went. And we had our first board meeting, board meeting at EV West in probably October, 2019. Oh, wow. Okay. And we talked about the idea and what we could do with it. And uh, that's how it started. That's like kind of how it came about. It, it came about as my time in the Boys and Girls Club and kind of having a twist of, of a version of the Boys and Girls Club in uh, this cool electric field. That's crazy. So you literally like you went from person to person till you had like a complete like team, a complete like group of people, individuals, you know, and it happened like that. Wow. The, the, the group, the names that came up, it was the, from the from the time Michael and I met about the idea. I think within five days we had everyone. That's crazy. We had Margarita, Marshall and Adam. Like we're in, I don't know. We don't know what it's going to be. I'm not exactly sure what you're asking me, but I'm in. <laughs> I like the idea. So with that, I have a question. Like when you were like building EVLC from the ground up, was there ever a point within you where you were like, like you wanted to give up like this project, like the a, a really tough time where you were like, maybe this is not a good idea. Maybe I shouldn't do this. Maybe I should do something else. I don't know. Just any moment like that. Yeah. Doubt creeps in all the time in everything you do and everything I do. Uh -huh. You know, I think for humans, it's, it's a natural thing. And even before, there was a lot of milestones after that meeting in October that came about. And each one of those milestones, we knew it was a great idea. What it was going to look like, how it was going to work, where we were going to get our money. You know, each one of those things as they come up, you know, I had doubt. So like signing the lease, like we're going to get this space. And, you know, October, we made the decision to proceed and get space. And there was a space that was available across from, from EV West. And we knew it was perfect because we'd be right near EV West. So we could, you know, they could help us with the programming and help us get exposure. And uh, yeah, even the time when we were waiting for that space, there was a five month period. We're like, oh, this is, how are we gonna do this? Where are we gonna get the money? Is this gonna work? You know, there was a lot of doubt. So we got our keys March 1st, 2020. So March 1st, 2020, think about that time. Was it March 14th, the world shut down? Yeah, right. Oh, two wow, weeks was... to flatten the curve, right? Two weeks after we got our oh. keys, the world shut down. Yeah. So you want to talk about doubt, Daniel? That's so much doubt creeped in. And you know who held it together over all those years? Who? Margarita. Margarita really? kept, kept like, this is going to work. Don't worry. Every time I had a doubt, I've rarely voiced it. But I just didn't know how all the pieces were going to work, especially once COVID hit. And there was so much uncertainty every, in everywhere, right? Yeah. And so now we can't have kids. What are we going to do? So, uh, yes, there were a lot of times of doubt. And um, fortunately, I had Stephanie. I had you. I had Ivan. I had Margarita. I had Eli. I had Michael. Julie. Uh, we had... Uh, you know some uh, some of the other kids we had um gosh who, who else did we have stephanie we had um there were a few there were uh, there were some of the other kids the businesses we had gabe adam's son gabe who came around and then adam's uh, brother came around a couple of times and they'd come around the learning center and at least allow us to to try some of the curriculum with kids Right with live kids because otherwise we were gonna. This is before Zoom was as big as it was. Yeah, we're like, okay, we have to figure out a way to do it online, and and we just didn't have equipment, we didn't have the knowledge, uh, but we kept going, right? We kept going, and you came around, you helped us film and and join the mm -hmm. youth advisory board, and we just kept doing these little. We just kept moving forward, no matter the doubt, 
no matter the hurdles that were, we took small steps forward, no matter what was happening. That's good. Most people would just like call it quits and just be like, oh, there's COVID going on right now. Like, what do, what do I do? You know? So it's cool to see that you could, because with EVLC, it's something that's like hands on. It's something like that's learning, you know, so it's kind of challenging throughout those times to like, you know, make it work. But you guys kept on pushing through it and it's nice to see, you know, it's very true. And you know what? You know what it was, Daniel and Stephanie, that it was the little impact. So we saw little impacts with you guys, with you and the filming and the stuff that you did. We saw Stephanie and the things that she was doing. We saw Ivan and his inspiration. We saw these little, little spots of inspiration, even with the limited amount of exposure we had. We saw impact, you know, and some of the kids, friends and families, kids that were there, like Carlo was there, right? Gabe. And each one of those little successes that we experienced bought us more hope and bought us more time, right? It got us to the next one. And that, and that, and that's, and that's just kind of how it works, right? You need, you need a win. You need a little win. You don't need like a home run. Yeah. Right. But if you can get a little, a single, you know, then, then it's going to get you cl that much closer to the home run. So there were a lot of little successes over those years from March, 2020 to, I we did our first program summer, 2021. So we had 18 months of, of uh, very limited, uh, just very limited things we could do. Yeah. Well, it's good to see that it worked out. Everything's worked out so far. So, yeah. So what was your first job? Well, let's see, my first job. So my dad was a contractor. So uh, he did, he, he was in construction. So he did. Uh, so every day after school, I would say I probably started when I was. No, it's not true. It's before that. Before I started working with my dad on the construction side, I used to mow grass. I would go around and knock on doors and ask people if I could mow their lawn. We had a lawnmower, I had a little can of gas and a weed eater, and I would push it around the neighborhood. That was my first job. How old did you say you were? I started that when I was 10 years old. Wow. Yeah, That's five crazy. bucks. Five bucks? I charged five bucks. Five bucks. Yeah, yeah wow. I do. I do actually do five for just the front and then five for the back. So 10, 10 total if you want to both. How many yards would you say you did in total? Like Gosh, around? On, the, on the weekends, I don't know. I'd probably make like, I'd probably, probably have like maybe five people say yes. Okay. It, it, it wasn't much. And you know what I really learned about that is I learned how to accept no's. Ooh. Right? Because people would open, sometimes it wouldn't open their door. Sometimes it would open their door and they'd just say, no, no, thanks. Yeah. And some people just know. And, and so I really got to learn how to hear the word no and not take it personal. Yeah. And they just, you know, because it, and it, it's much easier when you're a kid for some reason. As you get older, it's harder to hear the no's. <laughs> yeah, I bet. That's interesting because, like, most people, when they hear no, it's like, oh, it's the end of the world. Like, yeah, oh. it's discouraging. Yeah. It's funny. I didn't think about that until now, like that, mm -hmm. uh, that, th those lessons that I learned at that age yeah that's crazy but i was gonna ask um like going back to the evlc thing what would you say like your mission is for the company so our mission really is you know if i had to like peel away the actual mission statement itself uh-huh and and we want to find we want to we want to change that kid's life that would have never had like any exposure to this this industry right to this environment where they can come in and and learn how to learn you know play with a toy like a scooter or an electric skateboard and 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 use tools and take it apart and build a battery and then have that experience of actually going and riding it, having that satisfaction, like the, that the mission is to find that kid. And when I say that kid, I mean 
those kids. Yeah. But when you put it in, in, a, in a form of a vision is you take that kid and you change that kid's life by giving them a, a safe place to go where they can have fun and they can learn something that may change the trajectory of their entire life. So, so the mission is to change that kid's life. And when I say that kid, I mean as many lives as we can. Yeah. Okay. So tell us something interesting about yourself most people don't know. Oh, that's a good one. Something interesting about myself most people don't know. Well, I did live in Vietnam for a year as an adult. Oh, wow. wow. I, moved, I moved to Vietnam when I was, gosh, 32, my wife and I wow. and our daughter. We took a year off and we did something totally different. We just put the business on pause, moved to Vietnam. We started a little beach bar and uh, we did surf camps and we did dirt bike tours in Vietnam. That's, that's so that's, cool. That's very well, interesting. I didn't most expect people that. don't know that. Yeah. We learned, wow. Viet, we learned Vietnamese, which is not very easy. Uh -huh. We struggled with it, but uh, yeah, we just totally immersed. We went over there and uh, spent a year there. And I don't, I don't think most people know that. Yeah. I didn't do it. But did you like, like anything about vietnam as compared to here was there anything yes. that like what you know what i learned daniel is that when you go out and travel the world at the end of the day like people just want simple things like they just want to spend time with their family uh you know go to work come home go on a vacation like people's lives are very simple my impression of vietnam or Southeast Asia is that the countries are very poor and mm -hmm. that the people, um, their resources are very limited. And, you know, I had this impression. And when I got there, what I noticed is that every morning around the same time, just after sunrise, the entire city would go to the beach. Like literally the whole city, the whole city would go to the beach. There were people playing badminton there were people swimming there were people playing soccer there were people running there were people doing tai chi like the entire city was outside on the beach and then and then and then about two hours later he, everyone would go home they would get ready for work the kids would go to school um, the parents would go to work and then about one o'clock everything shuts down everyone goes home and they spend time with their family and they eat a meal together and they take a nap and then they go back to work maybe two three more hours and at five o'clock every day the entire city goes to the beach again and they're exercising there there are some people just eating fresh seafood on the beach you know they're running around they're just they're spending time to get like quality time together without their phones hanging out drinking coffee um it changed my perception of you know, what's valuable in life and what really matters. Cause sure in the U S we have, we have a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of wealth here, but the resources there are limited. They don't make as much money, but, but they were happier than most Americans that I know and rich in their life Yeah, and in, in what they do in, in everyday activities. And that so, was something I noticed. That's so true because like these days people are like, you know, they're caught up in social media and all these different things, so many distractions, but yeah, it's just cool to see people spending actual quality time with each other. It's so nice to see, you know? Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. What do you like to do in your free time? On oh, my free time. Think about that definition of free time. I like to fly, mm -hmm. I like to go fly, fly a plane. Uh, I would say that I like to hike with my dog, and my wife, I like to go hiking. We'd love to go to the gym, go to the gym together as a family. And um, yeah, I'd say volunteering and learning, you know, learning, learning it, just continuing to grow and learn. That's what I try to do with my, my free time. That's cool. I was going to ask, um, speaking on the what's it called the grass cutting business yes like we were talking about life lessons and things you've learned i want to know some other things that you've learned just from any any other events in life that 
have come your way like what are the most important life lessons you've learned so far uh let's see i would say that i've learned the most from hearing other people's stories hmm. not from reading a book well i guess i guess from reading a book could be could could fall into that but talking to people and listening to people is probably where i've learned the most in my life and asking questions asking a lot of questions was there anybody who you looked up to like that you would ask like a mentor maybe someone that you just came to i've always had mentors in my life people that i've looked up to uh at each at each point in my life i'd have different mentors when i was um in high school my basketball coach was awesome i would talk to him about all my business ideas and you know everything and actually there was a um my business uh there were, we had a business class in high school and my teacher there owned owned a business and was a teacher and so he was a mentor of mine um coming out of high school uh when i started working in the hotel business i had a mentor that helped me from the time i started in the hotel business at 19 to the time i got out at I was 24. He was my mentor and helped me each one of each one of my steps. And then I got in the mortgage business. The guy that got me in the business was my mentor. You know, up until he passed away about six or seven years ago. And so I've always had mentors. You know, I would say the funny thing is, um, you know, in, in flying, so piloting, uh, I have. Uh, flight instructors they're essentially my mentors and spending so much time with them in the plane to learn how to do different procedures and things of that sort uh and then in the learning center it's very unique because this might surprise you but my mentors are all around me it's different it's not a single person really so, yeah like the kids just everybody yes. yep i learned from you guys uh -huh. i learned from margarita i learned from michael i learned from adam i learned from marshall um, I, I learned, like I, I learned so much because I don't know anything about electrical engineering, nothing, <laughs> zero. I knew zero when we started, I know people and I like people. That's about all I bring to the table. Um, but yeah, I've learned so much from what, what, like, what you guys like and what inspires you and the differences between each person and. Yeah, so I would say in the in the nonprofit side in the learning center, uh, you guys have all been my teachers and mentors, which is really neat. That's crazy. So wow. I have an interesting question. Okay. If you won, if you won ten million dollars tomorrow, what would you spend it on? God, it's, my answer is so different than it would be ten years ago. Ten million. I would invest all of it. I wouldn't touch it. You wouldn't touch it? I wouldn't touch it. I would invest it all. I would, would invest. What would you it. say like years ago? What would your what would your answer be? God, ten, ten. so twenty years ago I would have spent it. <laughs> ten years ago, I would have spent seventy five percent of it and invested twenty five percent okay. of it. Okay. And now I can live off what I'm making now. So that money, I would bank it and I would, I would find a way to take that 10 million and grow it to a point to where it's always growing. And then it was, so it's, it's continuing to grow long after I'm gone and that money will feed nonprofits like EVLC. You know, our other nonprofits around the world. It'll, 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 it would be its own entity that would continue long after I'm gone. Okay. I have another interesting question too. Okay. If you could have one superpower, any superpower, what would it be and why? Oh, a superpower. I'd want to fly. You would want to like fly? Be able to fly, my, fly like myself. Yeah. What would you do? Where would you go? Everywhere. You would just travel the world? I'd go everywhere. Yeah, I'd go everywhere all the time. Okay, that's cool. Yep. 
I think mine would be like I don't know why, but like I would want some kind of like everything I touch like turns to gold. That would be sick. Yeah. Like what would you do with all that gold? I don't know. Just sell it or something. <laughs> like touch it and then sell it. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I don't know. What about you, Stephanie? What's yours? Um, I think invisibility. Why would you choose that? Um, that's a good question. I'm not exactly sure, but I think it'd be a really cool superpower. Yeah. Okay. That is pretty cool. I don't know. I feel like that's an interesting question to ask because everybody has different answers usually. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, just the three of us had totally different answers. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. So the last question, how are okay. you making the world a better place? That's a really good question. Ooh. So I would say that this is a daily aspiration. Okay, so I aspire to, to make the world a better place every day, right? And Sometimes it's as little as picking up a piece of trash on the ground, right? Because that's, that's an impact, right? Picking up a piece of trash. Sometimes it's giving someone a compliment, right? Hey, the, you know, so a stranger a compliment. Hey, those are cool shoes. Or hey, you know, you do it, someone that's working, that's working really hard, you're working really hard, or you're doing a great job. Uh, so I try to, I aspire to do those on a daily basis. Uh, and then on a bigger picture that I want to be long lasting after I'm gone is, is um, having this nonprofit succeed the learning center where it will continue to allow, continue to be a safe space for kids to come and learn and have fun and potentially build a career for themselves. You know, those are the ways that I try to change the world and just, and, and the way that I am on a daily basis, I try to be the best version of myself so I can inspire just by being a good human being. I'm not all, always, but I aspire to be a good person and, and to hopefully uh, be a good example. You know, have you ever heard the quote, be the change you want to see in the world? Well, that's a good quote. Yeah. I've never heard it. But. Yeah, so be the change you want to see in the world. So sometimes I have to actually say that to myself. So if I'm complaining about something, I have to say that to myself. You know, oh, traffic or, you know, it's too hot or, you know, like it's like or, or whatever or, or something's not going your way or you think you have it so hard. And I have to remind myself that. And that's when I, when I need to remind myself, that's what I say. Be the change you want to see in the world. Okay. Thank you so much, Ryan. Yes. Thank you for joining us today and yes, for absolutely. everything you do to inspire others because you're making a change, a huge change, you know? So, yeah. I appreciate that. And, and you, thank you, you two do inspire me. You do. Both do. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ryan, though.